everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Dancing Professor. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the origins of human factors, specifically the origins of electronics and how uh, electronics and electronic engineering became a very big topic of human factors research. So uh, as an overview, we're going to talk about the evolution of electronics. We're going to cover a very, very brief history, nothing too complicated. And we're actually going to take off from the point when computers entered the realm of digital technology because after the invention of the computer, everything else started to advance uh, extremely quickly from that point. Uh, then we're going to talk about electronics research. We're going to talk about the design of electronics. We're going to talk about a phenomenon called skeuomorphism. And we're also going to finish by talking about the modern advances in electronics today. So we know that electronics enhance our lives, or at least they're supposed to, by speeding up task completion, increasing efficiency, and decreasing the amount of effort we need to put in to actually get something done, most of the time. Sometimes that doesn't really work. So I'm going to show you a little clip. All right, well, so you can see, and I'm sure you guys can relate, you've all, all of us have encountered some sort of electronic piece of equipment that didn't really work uh, the way that we wanted it to, right? Sometimes we receive errors and we don't understand what they mean. Sometimes uh, we intend for it to work one way and it's actually not performing the main function that we hoped it would perform. So, of course, as we advance in technology, as new things are created and as new things are designed, with that must come new skills that we have to develop in order to use these new pieces of um, electronic equipment. So, of course, wherever uh, we have areas to improve, that's where research comes in. So before we actually talk specifically about the research, um, let's talk a little bit about the history of electronics. So, first of all, what is electronics? Well, this uh, domain is defined as the branch of physics and technology concerned with the design of circuits using transistors and microchips and with the behavior and movement of electrons in a semiconductor, conductor, vacuum, or gas. So basically, electronics employ low voltage current in combination with a solid state and integrated circuits or components. So basically, electronics transmit and process analog data with digital data. Early electronics were introduced in 1904 when a gentleman named John Ambrose Fleming who was a professor of engineering in the London University, invented the first radio tube called the diode, or some of you guys might know it as the vacuum tube. So a diode, right, uh, the prefix di means two, is a device with two terminals that allows for a one-way flow of an electric current. After this, uh, there were triodes invented and so on and so forth, but John Fleming was sort of known for creating the very first vacuum tube. So some of the first electronics invented included clocks, radios, telegraphs, light bulbs, telephones, cameras, and etc. And here at the bottom right hand side, um, that is actually an illustration of that first diode or vacuum tube. So here is a really overwhelming timeline of a bunch of different pieces of electronics that were developed throughout history. So here um, we have telephones, we have record players, we have radios, we have a handheld camera, uh, Sony Walkman, keyboards, telephone, Macintosh computer, um, and you know as time goes on the advances become more and more fancy and more and more intricate. So um, there are things that are in the professional imaging sector, in like uh, you know home appliances, professional devices. So um, it's really cool just to check this out and to see what year things were invented and when they became popular. 
a less overwhelming timeline um, is illustrated here. And again, this doesn't date back to the early 1900s because human factors, if you remember, originated after World War II, right? That's when everybody started becoming interested, interested in this topic. So you'll see a lot of things here post the 1940s, but it's still quite interesting to see um, the evolution of particular products, <laughs> excuse me, as well as the invention of them. So we went from, you know, a telephone that looks like this to now we have um, smartphones and mobile phones. And here you have an illustration of the Blackberry and then of the flip phone. And then, you know, fast forward 10 years later, now, you know, we have the iPhone 10 coming out. So um, I just thought that these were really interesting illustrations of the way that technology and with respect to electronic devices um, has evolved. So the impact of computers, again, um, was, was really huge in terms of electronics. And if you recall from our previous lecture, the first computer was built in the 1940s during World War II. Um, and if you would like to refresh your memory on that, please check out the lecture on origins of human factors about industrialization. So those first computers were extremely large, extremely heavy, and they consumed a really large amount of power. However, throughout the 1960s to the 1970s, computers significantly advanced and evolved. Of course, they now have greater processing power, larger memory capacity, they work much faster, they're not as huge anymore, so they're much smaller units, and they're much less expensive than they were when the very first computer had come out. So the computer became not only the property of a specialist, but it actually became a common item for the general population. And in 1978, that was the invention of the first PC, the first personal computer that had that main function of acting as a word processor. So computers essentially replaced electrical typewriters, and people were able to type more quickly with a smaller amount of errors. So with every passing day, technology continues to advance further and further. We are now uh, much less focusing on availability and invention of functionality, and much more focused on usability and efficiency of these particular products. So um, we've come a very long way. We've had a lot of research conducted since the 1950s that have helped us create standards for the way modern electronics should be designed. For example, most airplanes are being developed with the same instruments and gauges. Most guns are designed with safety locks because that was a main um, issue you know, during the war. Most telephones have become mobile phones which have ultimately all become smartphones, right? How many of you know someone that does not own a cell phone? Or further, how many of you know someone that does not own a smartphone? So on these smartphones, right, we are checking email, we're accessing social media, we're sending text messages. We almost like don't use this, the telephone as much to make simple phone calls and we use it much more for various other functions. Um, most computers have the same amount of storage space and the same processing speed. So if before, you would go to a store and you would compare which one has more RAM or which one has, you know, a larger hard drive. At this point, when you go to the store, those things are pretty equal in a lot of the models. And the only thing that sets them apart is maybe what they look like and possibly the price. So most cameras have the same zoom, field of vision, and lighting features, right? So um, if you know any photographers, right, they like to update. They're always looking for that really good camera. And it's actually pretty difficult to find you know, the best one because so many of them share a lot of the particular features that a photographer may be interested in. So the question boils down to what is it that is going to uh, make or break the success of a particular electronic device or a new product? Well, the thing that would be driving the difference in today's technology is its design. So when we talk about design, we're not only talking about how pretty it looks, um, how well laid out it appears to be, how big or small the font size is, right? We're talking about, is it usable? We're talking about, is it efficient? Does it actually get your task completed the way you intended it would? Is it novel? Is it creative? Is it new? Or does it look just like a copy of everything else that you've seen? So um, design is actually the driving force in today's market. And for that reason, um, we conduct a lot of research on design of electronics. And um, this is part of our electronics chapter because most of the things that we interact with today and most of the research that is conducted in human factors, of course, relates back to electronics since that's pretty much the type of products that we use. Um, if you can think of something that does not involve electronics that you use on a daily basis, I'm really curious to hear about those. Um, 
And, you know, it's just something, it's really good food for thought to really realize and sort of become aware of how much we actually depend and rely on electronics. And um, maybe in, in, you know, in, in reality, it actually does improve our lives. It, it helps us get things done more quickly. It decreases the amount of effort we need to put in to get things done. Um, so, you know, let's not take them for granted, but let's also understand that a lot of research has gone in to those particular electronic devices before they hit the shelves, you know, in your favorite electronic store. So, having said all that, now we're actually going to focus on the types of things that we, that human factor psychologists are concerned with when it comes to research of electronics. So, most human factors research today focuses on the improvement of electronic devices rather than their creation. So what are some examples of electronics that you use on a daily basis? Um, just, just think about that, you know, as we go through this lecture. Because the majority of current technological devices are based on particular standards, as we've learned, um, and these, these standards were established in years prior because all of this research was conducted in the aviation sector, in the industry sector, and all of that research eventually made its way, you know, to get published, and now we build and we create electronic devices based on the standards um, that was proven efficient and useful um, from research long ago. So um, engineers and designers now have the important task to come up with something new, right? Something novel, something efficient, and something useful. So uh, again, this becomes very difficult because there are so many competing brands and competing products um, within the same sector. For example, you have iOS and you have Android. You have Mac and you have micro and you have Windows, right? So there are, and and do they differ a lot in their functionality? Probably not. Do they differ in the way they look? Absolutely. Do they differ in their navigation? Yes, they do. So um, I don't know how many of you prefer, uh, you know, Windows over Mac or over, over Apple. How many of you prefer iOS over Android? But again, it's a preference, and it's very difficult to design one thing that will please absolutely everybody. And that's okay. You know, competition is great. But once you start to increase that competition, once there become so many of the same product, it becomes really difficult for us, the consumers, right, the users, to understand which version and which product is actually best suited for us. So novelty is a really important feature um, in electronics research and design, and it refers to creativity and innovation. The second thing is efficiency. And this refers to the usability and the success in completing tasks. And lastly, it includes usefulness, um, which refers to whether or not the product is addressing a user's needs. So if you remember back to our very first lecture um, on the origins of human factors, it was all about how current research and current design has to be concerned with who the user is and what the user is going to try to accomplish using a particular product. And so again, you might recall that designers have a very different perspective and a different way of thinking about their particular products and their designs. Um, and they differ from the way the actual user might be thinking about it. So that's why we do usability testing. That's why we have focus groups. That's why we're always concerned to know what does the user think and feel about all of this before we actually fully develop it. So this may sound easier than it is to make something new, to make something efficient, and to make something useful. So now let's actually look a little bit deeper into what each of these categories entails. Novelty and design. We'll start with that one. Designing something novel or new in electronics seems to be difficult because there are so many products that perform the same function but are branded by different companies. Transfer of training is really important for, for a product success. So if you remember from our aviation lecture what transfer of training was, um, that means that whatever skills you have learned when interacting with one system, you're able to use those skills when interacting with another system. For example, if you have learned on your iOS, you know, iPhone, that it is touch screen, you can still be able to understand and use the, um, use the skills of interacting with the device by touching it if you were to be presented with an Android, right? That is transfer of training. If you're sitting and you're driving, um, let's say, a Toyota, right, that is not stick shift, right, and it's manual, and, and you're driving a Toyota, then you jump out of that car and you sit into, I don't know, a Nissan, right, and you, are you still able to drive that car? Are you still able to press the same gas pedal 
you know, to accelerate the car, are you still able to press the same brake pedal? Would those be the same? Is the place where you put the key in to start the engine the same? So all of these things um, are very important whenever you're introducing a new product, right? So with electronics, we see this a lot, um, but there's this fine line of a designer justifying the fact that he or she has designed something exactly the same way as a previous product based on transfer of training, right? So you don't want to change anything drastically because then the users will be completely lost about what to do. Um, however, if you make it absolutely identical, then it will lose its novelty. So it's sort of a, it's a trade-off. <clears throat> if people are used to interacting with the particular device in a certain way, the competing versions or updated models should still function in a similar way. And again, there's a fine line between duplication and innovation in the design of electronics. Additionally, design fixation becomes a very common problem for designers. And if you think about what this means, right, fixation is to fixate on something. It's to spend a lot of time or a lot of cognitive resources doing activity X. When we talk about de design fixation, we're talking about getting stuck on an idea and not being able to come up with a newer or better design. Um, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but this is very common for writers, right? When they experience writer's block. It's uh, maybe an experience for artists, right? When they have to like sort of draw on demand. Um, usually creative people receive inspiration, you know, at like really spontaneous or random times throughout the day. Um, but when someone is actually asking you, and it, when, especially when it's your job, and they're like, okay, create a new version of this, but don't make it look like the old one. Um, so that becomes very difficult. And design fixation can be caused by several things. The first thing is exposure to prior designs, right? So this could be a designer's own personal design that they had done in the past. That's a really um, common way for designers to fixate. So if you always, you know, created your PowerPoint lecture with purple and pink colors, right, and you like that and it seems to work for your viewers, then you're going to continue making purple and pink lectures even if you try to change it and make it novel, right? You, uh, design fixation can also be caused by exposure to prior designs from competing products. So, for example, um, ah, I have a great example for you. So, one time we had a uh, research competition at our university and we had a group of students compete for a prize uh, based on the poster that they would create. So whoever had the, the best, the most creative poster would receive a prize and that poster would become the flyer for this research competition. So um, we actually did this as an experiment without fully telling them, but um, even though it was a real competition, we actually compared the drawings and, and you know the posters that people came up with. And so we showed them the old, the, the last year, you know, the previous year flyer, and we said, okay, here's a flyer from the previous year, you know, go ahead and make a new one. And so what happened was majority of the people actually drew it in a very similar layout. They used the same orientation of the paper. They placed the title in the exact same place. They placed the image in the same place. And so essentially they fixated on a design that they had seen before. So the second thing that actually causes design fixation um, is the idea that um, designers think their earlier ideas were better. So for example, um, you know, something like trusting your first instinct or, and you know, that's not always incorrect. However, if you're a designer and you come up with, you know, an idea at first, then you spend all this time thinking, no, that wasn't a good idea. Oh, maybe I should, you know, think of another way. And then like all this time and up to your deadline, you're thinking of other ways to fix it, make it better and newer and newer. And then ultimately you're like, I should have just gone with the first idea because that was the best. Um, low budgets is another thing for design fixation. So in industry, right, um, we have a lot of deadlines. And just like you guys have in school, for example, um, but these deadlines, you know, they're, they're not like, oh, you're going to miss credit for your homework assignment if you don't complete it. It's like literally a product is going to be held from being released on the market if you don't meet this deadline. So um, not to say that grades in school are not important. It's just that you are in charge of your own grades and your own success in school. Whereas if you work um, as a designer on a product team, you're letting down a whole group and even a whole company um, down. So it's really, really important to meet deadlines. Um, of course, to meet those deadlines, prototypes for usability testing have to be completed on time. 
If they're not completed on time, then testing gets pushed, right? And testing, research testing, of course, costs money. Participants want money, participants want incentive to actually attend your study, right? There always has to be some sort of a give and take. So research costs money, um, and obviously the, the designers are not the ones conducting the research themselves, so then they would hire researchers to test their product. So of course, you can imagine how these numbers would be adding up. So if a company doesn't have money to do testing, or if the, de uh, the deadline is coming up much too quickly, what's the easiest thing to do? To use an older version that already existed and that already seems to work. So in a sense, that is also design fixation. The fear of being blamed, right? So um, designers have a really, really important job to make things look pretty, to make things usable, um, to make things appealing for the user to actually be motivated to use it. So of course, you know, we have to be very careful when we give criticism or when we give uh, constructive criticism or when we critique a particular designer's work based on, you know, our professional opinion and based on what our participants or uh, users were saying in the usability testing. Um, but no designer wants to be blamed for a bad design. No designer wants to think, you know, that their, that their baby was not pretty or was not usable. So um, what they will tend to do is to revert to something that was appreciated by users and to just replicate that again. Um, and lastly, pushy clients. So this goes back to sort of like our low budgets conversation, right? If there's a deadline that you need to meet, and you know a client or a pro you know if you're working as a graphic designer for example or a web designer and you have a client that's like I need my website up and running by Friday because I have clients that need to book me or whatnot um, you as the designer don't have as much time you know to be creative to explore different ideas to ask the client hey do you like this font or this font this color scheme or this color scheme so when you don't have time right you're being pushed by the client again you're gonna fixate on maybe a similar web layout that you already made for a previous client, right? So there goes your novelty and there goes your innovation. So now we're going to talk about efficiency. Designers have to take into account the effectiveness of a proposed product. But how do we actually define effectiveness? How do we define efficiency? Like what is the definition of that? And once we do define it, how can we actually measure it? So it's difficult to uh, give this a definition, right, to define what is effective or what is efficient because people are so different in terms of their interaction with particular electronic devices. I can tell you if I give, um, I don't know, my GoPro to my grandmother, right, she's going to interact with it a little bit differently from the way I would interact with it. I studied and I work, you know, in the realm of technology. She probably has never seen or actually held a GoPro in her hand, right? So the amount of knowledge that we're bringing to the interaction, right, the amount of knowledge that we possess prior to actually interacting with a particular electronic device really determines um, our, our experience when we're using it. So you can imagine someone who has never had experience with it will call it less efficient, will feel like it's not actually as effective as it could be as opposed to someone who does have experience in the realm of technology who has used a GoPro and might see that it's very simple to use. So that's why um, everything prior to your experience with the interaction of the electronic device um, is really going to affect how, how effective or not you perceive the device to be. So some definitions that we came up with um, for efficiency include how quickly a set of functions can be performed using a given product. So essentially, when we talk about quickly, we're concerned about saving time. How successfully a product enables the user to perform a function or a set of functions without much effort. So here we're trying to save effort. And how willing users are to use the particular device, right? A device can't be called functional or efficient if nobody wants to use it. So that's sort of like increasing motivation, right? So uh, people will be willing to use it Yes, if it's efficient, um, yes, if it saves time, but also you ultimately, like, like the, from the beginning, there has to be some sort of a hook for the particular user, right? You don't want them to just walk by it on the shelf or in case people don't even go to the store anymore, right? They don't want to click past it when they're doing their online shopping. So something has to catch their attention, right? Something has to, um, you know, you know in, in the design, it has to be 
either very pretty, very neat, very sleek. There has to be something to actually catch the user, to actually bring them in, to want to experience it. So the most desirable products have a high degree of efficiency and functionality. So what are considered to be the appropriate and desired levels of efficiency and what is the appropriate and desired level of functionality? Well, unfortunately, nobody seems to have the answer to this. There's no universal definition, but researchers agree that users should be able to perform, you know, a given set of functions that the product is intended to do um, with minimal effort and minimal error. So this means that if you're using a particular electronic device, you should understand its intended use, right? So um, these days, right, it's difficult to understand what a phone is for because people do so many other things on it. But ultimately, a telephone is used to make phone calls. Does the device make phone calls successfully or not? Um, additionally, are you able to make a phone call without making an error? And are you able to make a phone call without making an error in a short amount of time? So that, that's sort of a way that you can integrate all three of them into having an efficient and functional device. Unfortunately, for many types of products, especially electronic devices, it's really difficult to increase the functionality of a product without concurrently increasing the complexity associated with its use. So essentially, the more, the more products can do, the more an electronic device can do, the harder it becomes to actually make it simple. So as you increase complexity, you might be decreasing, you know, sorry, as you increase complex, mm, Unfortunately, for many types of products, especially electronic devices, it's difficult to increase the functionality of a product without concurrently increasing complexity associated with its use. So this means as you add functions to a particular device, you're actually making it more complex. If it's more complex, it might possibly become more difficult to use. It might require more skills to be familiarized with before you can actually interact with it. It might require a little more education, a little more training. It might require you to actually read the instruction manual that comes with it. So this decreases the efficiency with which the product is used, right? And it also increases the amount of time it takes for you to be able to start doing things that you want to do with it. So there is this trade-off between efficiency and functionality. If you want something to be more efficient, you don't want to make it too complicated, right? And if it's not too complicated, it may not have as many functions. So there are really no guidelines given for how much loss in efficiency is acceptable for a given increase in functionality, right? There's no like <clears throat> code of contact, conduct that actually tells you, um, you know, here are the design rules. You have to have this percent of functionality for this percent of efficiency. Um, there's no, nothing like that. So with every product, each design team has to sort of gauge that um, based on their research team, based on their professional um, opinions and understanding and experience from working in the industry. And of course, ultimately, and the best practice is to actually put it in the lab and test it with real users. Because again, um, you will be surprised about how people actually interact with particular designs and how different they, they view the world than the actual designers or even the researchers. So for example, let's take the alarm clock. The intended use for the alarm clock is to wake you up. They have now added features such as a radio, a CD player, a snooze button, a mode changer, right? So additional functions may be desired, but their presence increases the complexity associated with operating the product and it also increases the chance of errors. So basically, the more, the more things that you're adding, right, the more likely people might click the wrong button. The more likely people will feel like they've made an error. Um, for, for example, they might actually, you know, interact with the mode changer instead of sliding the alarm on and off, right? Typically, the controls on an alarm are very similar and they're pretty small and they're really close to each other. So this is a modern day example of exactly what we talked about in our aviation chapter with the B-52 pilots, right? You have two controls that are very similar looking, that are positioned right next to each other, but have completely different features. Granted, you know, not, not lowering your landing gear is not as detrimental as, you know, missing your alarm, but ultimately we have to care about the users and we have to understand that they are purchasing this product or this particular electronic device 
with the idea that they need to complete the need of waking up on time. If you start bombarding them with a bunch of other functionality for this particular product that's actually eliminating the root cause for them to actually buy it, then it becomes a problem. So designers are under the assumption that users always want more, and this is something that we call functional bloat. And so here we see this very overwhelming prototype of what the iPhone 10 will look like. And it's called like the world's tallest iPhone or something like that. Um, so I don't know, it almost looks like a really stretched out remote control. It has a lot of apps and this is just one page. You know, you could probably slide through. It looks like there are four different screens here. But do you really need a device that can do so many things? Some people might say yes, some people might say no. But ultimately, designers feel like the users always want more, and that is not necessarily true. Because the more things you add, the harder the device becomes to use. So lastly, we're going to talk about usefulness in design. Designers also have to consider the usefulness of features of an electronic device. So even thinking back to that iPhone 10, sure, you can add 300 different app icons to your screen. But is that useful? Are you actually going to use all of those icons? Um, my personal issue with the way that iPhones work is that um, when you actually purchase it, it comes pre-installed with various apps that you actually cannot uninstall and you cannot get rid of. I use maybe like four apps on my entire home screen. So um, sometimes, you know, what the designers thought the users would need or would find useful are also a little bit um, mis miscommunicated. So it's important to consider which features users are willing to pay for, right? For example, apps, right? This is the example I just gave you. So typically, before a product is released, research is conducted to see which features are necessary, which would be nice to have, and which ones would not be used as much. Um, designers and actual users differ in their opinions of the necessity of product features. So details such as font size, white space, location of the, of the controls and the functions, and the accessibility all affect the usefulness of a good design, right? So ultimately, we want users to be happy with particular advances or updates or upgrades um, to a particular electronic device. So it, the only way that we can actually get um, the, the true and accurate feedback is to actually put it in a lab in usability testing. So um, this phenomenon of skeuomorphisms, um, I would ask that you guys try to say that, skeuomorphism. Um, and basically, this is a term most often used in graphical user interface design to describe objects on an interface that mimic their real world counterparts and how they appear or how the user can interact with them. So more specifically, some of these examples include the recycle bin icon used for discarding files, right? So if you use a computer, probably whether it's on um, Windows or Apple, um, you know, there, there's a little trash can, a little recycle bin where you would actually get rid of files. Um, so skeuomorphism represents affordances in the digital user interface. So it fits with our natural interpretation of objects, but in a digital world. So if you don't know what affordances are, those are situations where an object's sensory characteristics intuitively imply its functionality and use. Can a user understand what a product or feature is used for just by looking at it? So this is the very common icon for the recycle bin. Um, and if you saw this somewhere, this symbol, right, with a little bin of trash, you would understand that what is not needed would go in there. Like this is how you could get rid of something. So skeuomorphism relied heavily on metaphorical affordances, right? And so morph, again, means to change. Um, and basically, these are like imitations of real objects that we use to communicate um, the purpose of a particular feature. So icons are actually wonderful examples of this. Um, things like a map icon, a shopping cart when you're doing um, online shopping. Um, or a basket, and even the text would say, add to cart or add to basket. Of course, you're sitting at home in your chair or on your bed in front of your computer or your laptop. There is no cart, there is no basket, but again, that's mimicking you 
actually walking down the grocery aisle, adding things to your cart or to your basket, you know, and then checking out. Um, something like home, right? Not everybody lives in a house with the little triangle roof, you know, with the little picket fence. But again, that's a symbol of home, and we all, <coughs> excuse me, understand that. Um, printer, video. So um, I have a doggy cam. Uh, it's really cool. Um, I bought it on Amazon. Um, and it's really cool because I can actually see what my dogs are doing when I'm not home. Um, however, they've just updated it and a button that used to be a red circle to actually record footage from the camera was now changed to an actual like uh, retro style video camera, you know, the one with the little Mickey Mouse ears where the, the film is rolling. And so we don't have cameras like that anymore. So something like having a skeuomorphism like that would actually and might possibly confuse a user that, that, you know, like I've seen those cameras because I've seen history, I've seen film production, but, you know, fast forward 50 years from now, possibly the people who open that device will probably never know that that is actually a symbol for a video camera. Um, then you have microphones and phones, so all of these are different icons. Another really fun one is the save button on a computer. So I don't know if you guys remember, but um, before we had uh, external hard drives and flash drives, um, we used to have this thing like a three and a half uh, a inch floppy disk. And so even to this day, when you click on save, you see this little brown floppy disk appear as an icon for save. Nobody uses floppy disks anymore. So is that actually a good and accurate way to still represent the action of saving? So, um, and another example is the icon for email, right? So email stands for electronic mail. Typically mail is sent in an envelope, and so that's why we have the icon of an envelope for email. So the roots are in the metaphor of a physical letter that would be packaged into an envelope like that. It's really common for designers to get inspiration from the physical world, especially, you know, when they're stuck or when they're trying to come up with uh, an intuitive way to get a message across to the user. Um, so, you know, skeuomorphisms are really helpful um, in order to accurately and intuitively convey a particular piece of information to a user in a digital interface. Um, however, you know, these examples of save and the video camera that I just gave you, um, this is sort of leading to a debate about whether or not people have become so accustomed to what is called flat or digital interface on electronics that these skeuomorphisms are no longer necessary. Um, due to the fact that with time, the appearance of certain things have totally changed, and I apologize, my slide is cut off, um, but basically, as we advance, the, the way that things, that electronic devices look in our world today are constantly changing, so if we are going to use a skeuomorphism versus a flat design, then we actually have to make sure that, it, that our users are understanding its intended use. So here, is the perfect example of a skeuomorphism design versus a flat design. So on the left-hand side, you will notice that the icons are a little bit more three-dimensional. Um, you could see this, for example, with the game center, right? They're a little bit more detailed. You have chess, you have baseball, you have darts, um, you have battleship, right? Um, if you look at the newsstand, it actually looks like shelves. So they're a little bit more 3D. Settings looks like the inside of a particular machine. Um, Maps has a little bit more detail where you could see streets and highways, right? So this is the skeuomorphism design, and this is actually the flat design. So objects that were three-dimensional have become more two-dimensional, um, and now we're not we're using a little bit more abstract um, iconography. So here, if you look at um, the calendar, right, you just have the day of the week and and the date. Um, in the skeuomorphism, it almost looks like one of those peelable calendars. Uh, for camera, it's interesting because this looks less representative of what our modern day cameras look like, but it's not as detailed as the lens on this one. Um, you'll notice the notes, right, just looks like a clip art, you know, cartoonified notepad, whereas here it actually looks like, you know, a legal paper notebook. Um, for newsstand, now, again, it's just one flat image with some colorful boxes, whereas here we had that shelf. 
so so on and so forth but basically um, game center is actually an interesting one I'm not sure what the bubbles have to do with the game this seems a little more intuitive um, but so the question becomes do users feel like this is more intuitive the flat design or do users feel that the skeuomorphisms are more intuitive so um, in my opinion it's like a little bit of both some here make more sense while some here make more sense but again it really is up to the designers and the product development team so um, that's actually a really cool concept in design and next time that you guys uh, interact or purchase a new electronic device just check it out you know and become a detective really really dig deep and understand um, try to get into the mind of the designers and understand why they created these changes and how is this supposed to be an upgrade how does this make it more usable how does this make the product more efficient right so things like that are really fun to think about um, so modern electronics right in modern day um, again we still continue to do all of this research it still continues today even more so again as I mentioned because so many of the things that we interact with are electronic devices um, and it's really important to note that all of this increase in information processing has allowed us in fact to actually become more efficient in production manufacturing distribution of these products and consumption um, and so this industrial based society has sort of moved to an information based society um, before in the 1950s and the 1960s you know the world was really concerned about making products and and making things to help improve people's lives now we've sort of already done that and now we're just trying to make the things that we've created even more efficient even more useful right how can we change it how can we update it how can we get it to perform faster so tasks now require primarily mental effort as opposed to physical effort we no longer have to you know actually understand the mechanics of something now it's really all about understanding how to be trained to actually interact with a particular device successfully and most of that training of course requires time and as we talked about um, the trade-off between functionality and complexity um, the more complex something is typically is related to how many functions have been added to it but again that also relates to the number of skills and you know the training that you need to actually interact with them and that training would come from an instruction manual or a class or a course or an instructional video right so do people actually want to put in that amount of time do they want to put in the effort to actually learn how to successfully use something well that really depends on the person and it depends on the person's motivation for interacting with that product in the first place if it's like your job right if you're a visual editor or a photographer you know and you interact with Photoshop all the time that software and they're constantly updating it it's probably well worth your while to watch a tutorial video about the changes that were implemented maybe there are changes that you would never have known about had you not watched the tutorial video right and there's a faster way that you can use the blur tool or the magic wand for example right so um, we're really really putting a lot of pressure on our users and in terms of their mental capacity and really trying to um, create learning and education for all of these advances um, so yeah and you know all of these new electronic devices are coming out with different controls and controls are basically used to describe um, our human input into machines or systems so if we think about controls on a lot of devices these days they don't require like button pushes and they're not very 3d pretty much everything we use is touch screen but touch screen is tricky for controls because if you push too too strongly it might not register or it might you know it might act as like a double tap um, if your fingers are greasy it also won't register that if you press too lightly it may not register your interaction so um, controls you know are, are really tricky with touch screen specifically um, they range from simply physical controls to complex modes of inputting information right and an, a perfect example of that is the touch screen that we just said um, in another instance uh, besides being touch screen some things are very close together on a particular interface sometimes it makes it very difficult for a person with fat fingers um, or fingernails for example to actually be able to to navigate on a touch screen to actually accurately press where they want to press so th those are things that um, make it accessible 
and have good affordances. So those are really things that people that designers need to uh, think about when designing controls. Um, so all of this ultimately is to say that human factors is you know still thriving and in this modern day the issues that we primarily focus on again are ease of use right some controls can be difficult to activate because they have too much resistance or they're awkwardly positioned feedback um, this provides evidence that the control is working and has been operated but may be difficult to see or it may uh, or a person may be slow to register so for example um, I don't know if any of you guys use music apps but for example, on Spotify or something, right? If you want to create your own playlist, um, when you actually, you know, go to your three dot menu and you select add to playlist, um, what happens? Does the app actually tell you that the song has been added to your playlist or do you just never have a way of knowing? Sometimes when we download things, right, on our computer, we like to see that three dimensional arrow sort of like shoot down to the bottom of the screen or you have like a progress bar right we're always waiting for feedback from our particular electronics to give us a clue as to did the process work did it not work if it did work where can i find it so um, all of these things are related to feedback um, so a lot of devices actually um, a lot of electronics right or even websites if you think about it um, they have a lot of great features and functions, and sometimes people don't know about them, so they've come up with this idea of pop-up notifications, um, and they'll like sort of show up on your screen for five seconds, and they'll disappear. The other version of the pop-up notification is that it will appear on your screen until you interact with it and say, like, okay, got it, or dismiss, or cancel, or something like that. Um, and so the whole the logic behind that was that people were sort of missing main functions of a particular electronic device when they were interacting with it. And so in the lab, we, we, we were able to see that. And so research went back to the design team and said, you guys need to give more feedback, give longer feedback, find a different way to provide feedback to the user that something is actually happening when they're interacting with it. Um, dimensions, right? The size and shape of a control need to meet the task and human requirements. So um, for example, the remote control, right? Did you guys ever wonder why it's created in that shape? Um, did you ever stop to think about, you know, the grip? Um, even, even like a computer mouse, right? Those come in all different shapes and sizes. You see keyboards now that have like an armrest. So um, shape and size really has a lot to do with whether or not um, an electronic product will be useful or not. Um, location and layout, right? The controls should be laid out in order to meet task requirements and the user's physiological characteristics. So if you are, let's say, sitting in a car, right? You don't want your gears to be very far um, from where you're sitting, right? So if you, of course, if you push your chair all the way back or all the way forward, then you'll be sitting in some awkward position. But for the most part, there is a standard um, ratio between where particular controls are located in, respect, in relation to where the passenger or the driver would be sitting. And we saw a lot of this when we talked about the ergonomics of a cockpit, right? So check out those case studies where we talked to pilots and we talked to um, aviation training people and experts, and they actually show us the ergonomics of an airplane. They show us inside the cockpit. They explain um, the, the distances between the various gauges. They explain the distance between the pilot and the things that he or she has to interact with. So um, all of those things really play a huge role in human factors research. Um, and then the control and display relationships. So controls need to be compatible with the displays in terms of operation. So a perfect example of this is the QWERTY keyboard, right? So it's very popular on the market. It's sort of become the standard for the way that we design keyboards. However, if you think about it, it really overloads the left hand, which is not the dominant hand in a majority of people. Um, and it also uh, forces us to stress the little fingers, right? So our pinkies are generally shorter than the rest of the fingers on our hand. Um, and so we actually end up having to use it a lot in order to you know, create the optimal experience on using this keyboard. Um, it also involves typing more in the top row rather than in the center. So um, this is a perfect example of something that's in the market. It's doing well, but if you think about it um, and you ask users how they like it, right, and, th and their experience with it, 
these are the kind of things that they're that they're saying so basically we want to make sure that the relationship between how a product looks and the controls and how we interact with it are actually um, meeting and they're actually agreeing on on the way that it's intended to be used so again technology is nowhere near done advancing right I mean it's really difficult to even predict what's going to happen 10 years from now but we can predict that human factors research will be around and that research will continue and that designers will still continue to think one way and users will still continue to think the other way and so human factors researchers are sort of the mediator where the you know the referee between these two teams um, that are trying to help them see eye to eye so um, yeah on that note thanks everyone for watching uh, please subscribe to the channel if this is something you're interested in and if you have any questions about you know electronics in general electronic engineering uh, research on electronic design um, any of those things you know please I'm more than happy to answer those questions I'm more than happy to address them on one of our next episodes um, otherwise thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time